Now we're going. Now we're going. Should be good. Let some people meander in here. <clears throat> I've had this like little frog in my throat uh, since this afternoon. Don't panic. It's not the big one. Um, I'm going to try to use the original session for this, for uh, this original track of mine, for the mix down tutorial. And if it starts to give and starts to kind of bog down the processor, then what I'm going to end up doing is dragging audio files in from, from the session that I've, that I've rendered out and kind of rendered out. Uh, mix parts so and I just am pulling those up to make sure that I've got them yep I've got all those so I've got those on standby can everybody hear me just fine every all the audio clear and whatnot and we'll do a little Good there. Audio's good. Great. Great, great, great. And I think I will probably flatten these as well. No, I'm going to keep this one going because I want to show you something. Okay, so how's everybody going? How's everything going with everybody? Um, give me a baseline of how many people are beginners here and how many people are more experienced producers and whatnot. That'd be useful. And we've still got some people coming in, so... I really need to oil this chair. Um, that would be probably helpful for all of you. Um, but baby steps, baby steps. Okay. So I'm just going to start walking through the track that I've made. And I picked this. The reason I picked this track actually is because it was kind of a pain in my ass to mix down. And um, to be honest, there would, it's still not, uh, I, in my opinion, this track's not ready to go off to mastering uh, for, a, for a few reasons. But I thought that it would be really good if I could show you this track so that you could see kind of Hopefully I can show you kind of the process through which I struggled on some of the mix elements and some of the pitfalls that come with that. Um, first thing I want to ask for all of you in here is how many people, what, just list off, that's good information. Good that uh, Piotr, Heather, and Rogner, uh, Weekend, you just began, began this weekend. That's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, okay, we've got a lot of beginners in here. Uh, keep that feedback coming. And also, I want to know how, what, you're, what you're making music with. Are you making it with headphones? Um, if, just tell me, put in, the, put in the comments what you're making music with. 
what if you're using headphones what type of headphones if you're using um, speakers what type of speakers and and in fact if you're using speakers say what kind of room you're in and uh, let me know if the walls are just kind of empty or if they're if they've got in like artwork on them or I mean not artwork but uh, let's just say if you've got acoustic proper acoustic paneling on the walls um, that would be helpful too because I can I can kind of give some insight on if, if there's a lot of people using speakers I can kind of give a few tips on that uh, and any questions that you would have because for me for me, mixing is all about like the easier, the easier you can hear what you're trying to mix, obviously the better it's going to be. And I mean, it's, it would be no different than like driving with a muddy windshield and the like i said everybody you you can't get so hung up on achieving the perfect setup cuz you're never going to achieve the perfect setup a uh, friend of mine that i know through years from the rave days years ago he ended up going on to produce um to produce like more commercial hip hop stuff and he had a time where he was out in Los Angeles and he was actually, um, he was actually using, he had a, a room that was Rick Rubin's old room that he produced in. And he could not get a very critical frequency right in that room. You know, so if you go, if you get two, it was like 120 hertz or something, which is a pretty important thing to get under control. And there was just, I think, a dip in the room and he had tons of consultants and acoustic engineers come out and nobody could fix it. It was just the way the room was dimension wise and there was nothing that could be done. But I think it helped in knowing that this was the room that the guy who produced the Beastie Boys and so many other people like and made Grammy re winning records, he produced this in an imperfect room. He did have the luxury of sending off his productions to a mix engineer, which a lot of us will never have the luxury of doing. So yeah, but you're never gonna get, you're never gonna get to, that, uh, to that place of perfection Okay, so we've got, Heather's got HD25s, Arturia Mini Lab computer, Sennheiser HD440s, although I listen through my girlfriend's monitors in the bedroom without proper acoustics. Okay, um, sometimes also listen on a Bose Bluetooth speakers just to see how it sounds on something else. That's a great idea. Um, you know, when I was first producing actually, uh, one of the things that I would cross-reference, it was really, really strange. Uh, Dino, Dynaudio uh, BM5, a, BM5As, I think, is what, and then um, GIK Acoustics. It's a good setup. Um, yeah, one of the things that I would do whenever I was first getting started is I, I would have my studio. I had my Mackie 824 studio monitors and everything set up. And I would listen to that, but I knew if I put it on, I had an old, um, before it was MacBook, it was called a PowerBook. And I would put it on my PowerBook and I would know if the kick drum was in the right place by what type of feel it, I would put my hands on the bottom of the laptop because I was always listening to music on my with my laptop in the exact position. And I knew like based on some of the vibrations that you would feel on like a well-produced track, if it was lacking there, then I knew that the bass wasn't right. I wouldn't recommend such a crude way of testing your tracks, but there's, there's the more places you can get it set up on or the more places you can hear it on, 
the better it is. And really what getting, the closer you get to a perfect setup, it, it doesn't mean, the, the thing it means the most is you're gonna save a lot of time because you're, you can sit in that room and you don't have to take it to your car or to like all these different sources to check it out. So um, you can produce with anything and you can get nowadays pretty good, uh, pretty good, um, you can get really close with some pretty low, low dollar equipment. So yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Very, that is a very small room and GIK acoustics, but honestly, the, the fact that you've got the BM fives is better than the, the BM sixes, because if you're in a small room, like you don't really want big speakers in it. And that's a big problem that often happens. Um, Mark, this question is from uh, Marcus. Um, hey Kyle, which recommendations do you have for pre-mastering a track? I'm using mostly Ableton's pre-listed options and mis mixing and mastering, but I'm not really satisfied with the result. I'm using Audio Musica, uh, um, ATH M50X headphones, by the way. Thanks for all this. Okay. Um, Marcus, the, the big thing is, um, the, when you're the, I'm going to teach like basics because like, yeah, there's going to be these presets like in Ableton you have, uh, let's say, I think it's in audio effect. And then you go to like audio effect rack and then there's going to be mixing and mastering and there's some things that can, there's some things that can help you out. Um, when I, when I'm doing a mix down of a track, I have all of this stuff on the master channel turned off. I never have processing on the, the master channel. And that's, that's a big thing with like doing a pre-master. Um, I always give it, one thing I always do is I always give it some very comfortable headroom and what i mean by that and i think i so showed you this in the earlier workshop if you collectively bring down the volume like it, you can click on your first track and then click on the very last track and then you can like lower the volume of all the tracks together and that way the important thing is when you play a track is to look at the meter coming into the master channel and make sure that that's nowhere near clipping. Okay. If it's clipping, then we need to, you need to make adjustments by bringing down the volume all, all together. Um, okay. So this is from Chris. Uh, a more advanced producer had a release on rising high records, but have always struggled with mix downs. I use Sennheiser HD 25s, but my room isn't acoustically right. And, uh, massive wardrobe fills up half of the room. Um, okay. That's good to know. Um, okay. So that that that's all good information that we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through, I, I think I did like 10 or 15 different mix downs of this track and I'm still not, um, fully, fully comfortable with it. And for those of you who just gotten in here, the reason I chose this track is because of how much I struggled with it and that I, the fact that I'm still struggling with it. Um, and I'm just gonna walk through the process and kind of show you where I went wrong and where, where things were not so good and where I found some, some comfort in. But uh, this was also a track that I did a long time ago and kind of chiseled away at it over time. And there's a lot of stuff. And I think I've talked about this in a workshop before, like 
I sometimes I look at things that I did and I'm like, what am I doing here? So I took down, I took off a lot of the processing and stuff and I'm kind of working backwards on it. So first thing that I had was the bass and the kick and really like that's so much of the battle with the bass and the kick. How's the volume level on this? Compared to like, if you, can you still hear it when I'm, should I bring up the volume a little bit? Okay. How's the volume? Okay. It's very low. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to break my own rules. I'm actually going to bring up, I'm going to turn on the limiter to just get, to just get some umph out of it. And yeah, then I'll be able to, that's cool and all, but where's Ozzy? I mean, at some point you got to wean people off the Ozzy addiction. How you doing, Chris? Everybody that's in here, Chris Chant is the single reason that I learned how to DJ when I did. Um, I met Chris freshman year in university and I went up to him when he care was carrying up to his dorm room what looked to be turntables and I stopped him dead in his track. And I, I said, are these turntables? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I think I, I think I just asked, you want to hang out or something like this? I don't remember the exact nature of it, but it was pretty clear, I think, to him that uh, I was I was coming up to his dorm room, and yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty awesome. So okay, I'm gonna bring up the volume a little bit. Is that are we still are we okay with that? Okay, so it's weird because this is like a, this is a pretty driving track and with driving tracks a lot of times I'm not putting really complex bass lines on them. People always ask, people always ask, they're like, how do you get this like, they always call it like the reverb kick or like something like that. And the reality of it is, is that there's not reverb on a lot of the stuff that sounds like that sounds like there's reverb. And when you hear those things, those sounds in clubs and stuff, a lot of times it's the room that the club is in that's creating that reverb. So <laughs> that's a funny story, Chris. Um, glad I could make you blush. Uh, so keep in mind, also trust in the mixing process. You're hearing a lot of these massive tracks in a club. That's like this huge concrete room or whatever, and there's gonna be a, a just natural reverb to it. And I would, the first thing I would really encourage you with as we're on the kick and the bass section is trust, trust that the room is gonna add a lot more reverb than what you could imagine. And so, Give if you if you're gonna err on one side when it comes to reverb, err on the side of dry instead of wet, especially with especially with kick drums and bass drums. Like um, kick drums and bass drums are the same thing, by the way. But uh, I meant bass lines. So yeah, let me just go here, and I was just. At this point of this track, I was like, you know what, screw it. And I just started hot swapping uh, things, swapping, swapping different bass instruments out of the thing. And um, let me just play for you what it sounds like if there's no filter on. So, yeah. 
Yeah, not really anything that you would ever be proud of. But if you, now let me take this down. Let's pull this on. And then you bring this, bring that filter down to make it kind of like a narrow band pass. And the way you do that is you would put the, you can, you have these different settings and you just put the low pass filter. And in this case, I chose the 48 decibels per octave. This one's a 12 decibel per octave. You can read about that on different uh, tutorials or you can just search what like, just look up like 12 dB per octave uh, cutoff and there will be all kinds of nerd talk on that. But basically the 4, 4X is going to be a steeper curve. The 12 is going to be a more gradual curve. So it really just depends on what you wanted. But really for this, I just, this was such a busy track that um, I wanted I wanted to just have that bass kind of kind of push along the kick. And what I really wanted it to do, and this is where the this is where people sometimes ask, they're like, how do you get this big reverb kick? And like I said, this is how you create the illusion of a big reverberated kick without making it sound like dog poo. So yeah. So now you've got basically a super basic EQ. Um, I turned on the, if you can listen, if you're listening on headphones, I'm not sure how clear it comes. Keep in mind that this is, this is right here is where that kick drum is hitting. Um, probably you're like right here. And even here, you'll notice like the the kick drum, I, I notched out like a problem frequency and sometimes I'll notch out where the kick drum's hitting. If I want the kick to punch through a little bit more, I'll have, I'll notch out the frequency. Like in this case, let's see where the kick drum's hitting at. You can just drag, uh, oh, whoops. Let's get. So we're right around. Yeah, it's 52 hertz. So if you're ever having like, if you're ever having some trouble, and I turned off the uh, high pass on this to show you how muddy it gets. So it gets, it's pretty muddy there. If I, if I just turn that uh, right back on, the feel is still the same, but now I've created all this room for the kick drum to exist comfortably here. Um, I'm not always saying, I'm not always saying to, to completely roll that off. It's not, it's not gospel, but uh, the, the more crowded you get between the kick and the bass, the more muddy it's gonna, the more likely you're gonna encounter mud in the mix. Um, also keep in mind like there, the nine times out of 10, the, the bass is gonna sit above the kick in the mix in terms of in terms of techno because the the bass drum so so heavy um, sometimes in in different types of music like the a bass guitar to put it in perspective a bass guitar i think an open the lowest note on a bass guitar is 41 hertz and so if you've got a 50 hertz kick drum and a 40 41 hertz bass guitar, then you've got, you're going to have some problems. So keep in mind that you've got this, generally this whopping 50 hertz thing that's occupying the space and uh, just bear that in mind with, from starting with creating the bass line. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, that's a, Chris, it's an EQ8. 
Um, I'm trying to use mostly, this is a session that wasn't made for the workshop, so there's gonna be other plugins, but actually, most of, yeah, most of it are stock plugins. So I'm in luck on this session. Something else you can do, and uh, this is something like if you wanna if you wanna add a little bit of distortion on to oh you know what I'll delete this, and I'm gonna use the saturator here. Even if you and and keep in mind distortion is not always like this like gabber death techno effect distortion can do a lot to warm things up and add harmonics in a mix just very slightly so that if if you feel like things are getting a little bit frustrated then you can start adding obviously you don't want that But also keep in mind when you add distortion that it's gonna like bring the volume, it's gonna bring the volume up just a little bit if you start pushing it. Some, uh, some effects will have actually the, uh, as you turn up the d distortion, it, it compensates by lowering the volume, but in this case, the Ableton one does not. Any questions? So on stuff like this, uh, let's see here. I always, uh, I give it some side chain compression. Not always, but in this case, things start getting, a, when I, when this, when this sound, when this start, sound starts opening up and getting busier, one thing, again, that you want is, roll off that low end even when there's not that much low end there's always going to be a few artifacts and just just kind of carve it out to where you you don't need that anymore so just make sure you're because even if even if you've got like 12 db like the this spectrum's only showing down minus 12 db so even if you've got just something hovering right around here in the low frequency range, that's still adding some, some space, that's still crowding the space a little bit. If you, if you have every track that has a little bit under 12 dB worth of like 50 hertz range and you don't roll that off, that stuff will add up really quick. Um, keen to hear your thoughts on gain staging. Uh, Mikkel, um, I've told this, uh, I've said, mentioned this to someone else. Um, gain staging for me, I mean, it's always good to be, to be aware of, like you don't want, um, your, your source sampler, like your sampler turned up 24 plus 24 decibels. And then your equalizer, the gain turned down, um, to be negative 22 or something. Uh, you want things to not be fighting against each other and, and you're, gonna, you're gonna have a little bit better of a sound. But the, the big thing about that is you're not really getting like that much harmonic difference in the digital world by 
like the thing is with when you're doing like an analog signal path like every every place in the gain you're you're going to experience kind of different harmonics and then even if you start to 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 push it a little bit you're going to get more harmonics before it starts sounding awful whereas the digital world it's kind of like just don't clip you know and there's not going to be any advice that I'm sure there's a lot more technical people that could give better insight on this. But the thing you really want to be mindful of is just avoid at all costs ever. And you know what? You're going to see some hypocrisy on my end because I'm sure that at some point when we go through a track, one of these little signal paths is going to be kind of touching the yellow or the red. Okay. And that's just my hypocrisy. So, so you can tell that could be an indicator as to like how crucial it is. But once you start clipping in the digital world, then that's, that starts to become problems for the beginners out there. The question was about gain staging and what he means by gain staging. Um, Michael Mikhail. Uh, thanks for that question. What he means about gain staging is it's the idea of what your gain, like this would be the gain for this. So and I've got that, I've got that currently set at zero. Um, and then this would be another gain. And gain staging is talking about finding like a consistent balance in all of your like uh, your whole signal path. You don't want you don't want to have this turned up to 24 dB and then this one or say this one turned up 15 dB and then this one turned down 12 dB. Okay, the ideal thing would be to get this down to zero and then get this up to zero. And that's not a perfect explanation because there's gonna be times that for some reason or another, you're gonna need to adjust kind of artificially. But the idea is, is like, it's kind of, it's, it's the whole idea of like, you don't want someone like, like the McDonald's drive through the, the person can turn down their headphones, but if you're yelling into the speaker, it's not going to matter that they can turn down the volume. It's that you're yelling into the speaker and it's going to distort that sound. And then, so it, they can't really, there's, you've already made the quality of the sound source bad before the person's able to turn it down. But if you're yelling into, into their end, then the only thing they can do is turn it down and that's still gonna be imperfect. Hope that answers the question. So, yes. Um, any other questions before I move forward? Okay. Oh, I wanted to talk about uh, side chaining, um, just to go over that for those who maybe missed it on the previous workshops. Side chaining is basically, for those that don't know, side chaining is basically connect triggering a compressor from another signal. And the most common signal that you're going to trigger it from, though it's not always this way, is I'm triggering it from a kick drum so you can see that if you well you can't really see but this signal is not the signal from the sound you're hearing it's the signal from the kick drum okay so if i turn that off now the compressor is being triggered by the, the sound itself Okay, but if I turn the side chain on, 
you can kind of hear it. You can kind of hear it bouncing. That's because the kick drum's triggering it. But I want to have it, I don't want that bouncing effect to come through in the mix, but I do want to duck it during the, the kick. So I kind of set it to a point with the side chaining, I set it to a point until it starts to actually change the way the audio sounds. And then I back off of it. So obviously that's changing the sound quite drastically there. And a, a little bit of bounce to it is okay. And I, I should also clarify, as always, I'm on headphones that I don't mix with or whatever, but uh, yeah, so if you're saying, wow, he's teaching a class on, on mixing and this track doesn't sound good, then there you have it. Um, Another big thing that you can do to create, to create space. Um, let me show you, this is a weird thing that I did and so you should ignore that. Uh, something like this, this sound to me is not a crucial sound for like the groove of the track. Um, it's, it's more a texture sound. So what you can do, there's two different things you can do. You can either pan it. Go from left or, or right. And then when I, I usually do a lot of the panning towards uh, Corbin, I'm going to get to your question. I usually do uh, a lot of the panning um, at the end because it's hard to know like where the balance in the mix is going to fit. Like the best way I can describe panning is go with your instincts on if you feel like the track is getting a little lopsided, like then, then start throwing different sounds over to that other speaker. For those of you, and, and there's nothing wrong with producing on headphones as I've been doing that quite a bit, but something to be aware of with panning, when you're panning on headphones, if you, like for example, uh, I'm panning hard right here, if you're doing on headphones, you are only, like if you take that right ear off, you're, you're, you're not hearing anything out of the left ear, okay? Whereas, the thing is with speakers, you have to keep in mind, like even if you pan something hard right with speakers, your left ear is still gonna hear that sound. It's just going to affect the. It's going to affect the balance of that sound, and so you're. That's a tricky thing. That can be a tricky distinction between producing with headphones versus speakers. And it's always. That's why it's always a little nice if you have. It doesn't even have to be a good set of speakers. Um, if you have a set of speakers that has two that are that are in stereo, it's nice to get a feel as to how like especially if you're dealing with panning, it's a nice to get a feel for what to do on that um, just by throwing it on the speakers and seeing how it sounds. This question's from Corbin Davis. How about recording drum machines gear bounce out sounds individually? Sometimes sounds recorded together sound better than individually bouncing them from gear. I agree. I mean, that's a lot of people. Um, and, and let me just clarify. I have never owned a drum machine um, with like gear or whatever, but I do have synths that have like multi outs and you can 
re you could record them all separately, but sometimes sometimes you get a different effect. I mean, to me, that's recording a drum machine, um, recording a drum machine as one drum, like one, two stereo or a, a, one stereo out, to me, in essence, is the same as having a drum bus that you're processing. Like, you know, you're gonna, if you've got a drum bus, you might have like your kick, snare, blah, 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 blah. And then you're gonna process that master drum bus. And you might be processed or whatever compression you apply to the drum bus, you're affecting the, the kick, the, the snare, the tom, and everything with it. And you're, you're just gonna get a different approach. So I agree, if you can, I mean, the, the own, the, from a practicality side, it can be easier to go back and revisit and remix down the, the, the stems if you rendered them out separately or recorded them separately. But from like a sound perspective, I, don't, I would never tell somebody not to, not to record something the way they do just because there's practical advantages of the other way, if that makes sense. I hope that answered. So good to see you, Corbin. How, how is it going in Detroit? I've heard Detroit's having a little bit of a tough time. I hope you're doing well and good to see you here. So I'm going to pan this back over. If for some reason you decide, okay, you know what? I, it starts to sound a little bit out of balance as it is. Um, and, but I, I feel like I need to get stuff more over and I need to improve the stereo field. Here's something you can do from the EQ eight. You've got these modes here. So let's put this in the center. You've got these modes here. And this is the, the default mode is stereo. One thing you can, I would suggest doing, uh, if you could go into the, uh, oh no, they already have, it's already in the high quality mode. Okay. The old, uh, I never knew that, well, okay, you can do the oversampling and you can select that. And if your processor can handle that, select the oversampling. And then you can also save as default preset. Uh, so then it'll save that mode so that every time you pull it up, it gives you the, it's in the oversampling mode if your processor can handle it. I of all people understand processor limitations. So, yeah. Um, is anybody with Ableton, is anybody on a really old computer that's having processor issues or anything while I'm at it? Go ahead and answer that. But what I wanna get back to is, so there's the stereo mode. Here is left, right. What you can do, so here is, I'm editing, you'll see that it now it's got, I'm editing the left. So, so you can actually pan different sounds in different directions. Um, so Corbin, you've got no, uh, no processor issues. 2012 I'm at. So what I did here, you can see the, uh, 
this is the right channel. So I've got the I've got um, right around seven and a six and a half thousand hertz, um, and then I've got that dipped by about four decibels, and then I've got the kind of mid range right at like five hundred hertz. I've got that boosted by like. Um, five decibels or so. Then you go to the left and I've got that amount cut. The same amount that I have boosted on the other side, I've got it cut on the left channel. And then I've got um, it boosted on, uh, the high frequencies are boosted on the left channel, but they're cut on the right. Um, the reason that this can sometimes be an advantage is if it starts to feel a little if you feel like it needs to the sounds need to be panned just to get to create more space for um the center like the the bass and the the kick then this can create a lot of space without making the sound feel super out of balance and something you can do is you can play around once you've set that You can mess with the scale and it tells you, uh, it, it basically can invert it. It can make the, it can make the EQ adjustments more drastic or less drastic. I hope everybody can see that. Um, so yeah, that's another option. If, if the actual, um, if panning starts to make it sound a little bit weird, then just go so now you've got you've got kind of like a quasi panning going on okay so i'm going to boost the volume of this actually And I intentionally pitch this stuff down. Okay. Um, here I would say I've got like I want, this is something I sometimes do with like, I would imagine I might have already flattened this track. Uh, yep, I already flattened it. But I think that this is a maraca that I actually pitched down. And I did that because like, sometimes you can have like a little bit of a gap and a frequency gap where like the, the hi-hats or something just aren't quite carrying the track like you want it to sometimes it's it's lack there's a gap between like your your mid-range sounds and the high frequencies and doing something like pitching down a uh, and layering a, a hi-hat can do can do a lot of damage in that or a lot of good things in that direction i don't want to use the word damage in terms of mixing because mixing can be a very fragile process um, and I have ruined plenty of mix downs in my days um, I don't like there's a sound that's kind of popping out to me so I'm gonna go through and this is something if there's like You can turn up the turn up the cue on this. Um, you turn up the cue on this, and then you'd kind of sweep through with it boosted, and you can hear what's the sounds that you need to kind of that are annoying you. That's the one right there. Okay. Hey Tyler, you're back. Good to see you.
Oh, Lars, the reason, the reason I've got it at zero dB is because people just couldn't hear it. So I've actually got a limiter, a light limiter on um, the master channel just to boost the volume. But you're, yeah, normally I turn that off and I'm sitting at around between five and negative five and negative six or like negative four to negative five there. So yeah, <clears throat> Tyler, you're excused. I won't, I won't give you detention this time. Just never let it happen again. Um, good to have you. So, okay. And yeah. So let me put the limiter back on so people can actually hear it. Very basic. I turned this. This is a plugin that I sometimes use. You have to be careful with this plugin. But, and let me say, you can do everything that this plugin does with, uh, with an EQ, um, kind of. But, one thing that Ableton currently, and Ableton, if you're listening, I would love to see this, is if you could have a dynamic EQ. And to those of you wondering what a dynamic EQ is, I'm gonna pull up one. And I'll just go with um, the one that I'm most familiar with. So, a dynamic EQ is something that allows you to set like a, you can EQ something so that it's not always cutting something out. It's only EQing it once it goes above a certain uh, limit. And you can kind of see the visual, oh, whoops. So you can see that basically here's, here's you set a limit for when this frequency gets above a certain point, then it starts notching out the uh, equalizer, okay? So in this case, because it's always hitting there, um, you, don't, you don't really use the dynamic EQ there. But what it would be good for is, like sometimes if you're, if you're carving out too much of the low frequencies or a problem frequency, it can make the rest of the sound sound a little bit weird. And yeah, so if I, there's not a lot of need for it here but just explaining to you how it works. Um, but when I, I have my friend uh, Connor Dalton does almost all my mastering for tracks and sometimes I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll send him tracks and I forget to like just ask him what he thinks about it. Just like, hey, here's something to listen to and he'll write back and it'll be like five, it'll just be an email with five frequency bands where there's resonances. And it's super helpful uh, because it does help for like problem frequencies. And what you can do when I'm talking about that, if you're having trouble, if you can't really, if things sound muddy and you can't really tell where they're sounding muddy at, um, the uh, something you can do, and I'll use Ableton's EQ8. You're gonna wanna go, like if you're like, okay, so let's unmute this 
So now I'm, I'm on the master channel and I'm doing an EQ sweep here. Uh, and check this out. If I, if I go through, if I go through here and I sweep this frequency band like this, then what do I find? That's bass, like. So what I'll do then, I'm like, okay, I, I know I know exactly what sound is making that problem area. So what I'm gonna do now that I've found that problem area, I'm gonna take this EQ and I'm gonna uh, cut. So now it's on my clipboard. And now I'm like, okay, where's that track? Oh, there it is. There it is. And the reason I cut it there is so that I can remember what the frequency range, what the problem frequency is. And then I'll just duck it out a little bit. Okay. And again, resonances aren't always bad, but it's important to be kind of in the mind of which resonances are gonna cause problems in the mix. So now we're back. And Spots, uh, Spots thanks for writing. Um, no problem, this will be uploaded to YouTube. So don't worry about that. Um, Mikhail, that's a uh, Lars. I didn't. I didn't have uh, any specific tricks on it. I do kind of everything by ear. But Mikhail, that's an interesting thing. And uh, uh, Arjun uh, Vagali had said um, something about this. And so what's your thought on it? Are, are you liking this mixed in key plugin? Um, is it accurate? I heard someone else talking about it and they said there's some accuracy issues, but that it's pretty helpful. What's your, what's your take on it? Okay. So I'm gonna do a few more sweeps here. And to clarify, I don't keep this EQ. I just do it to find the, it's a faster way to find problem frequencies than to like go through each and every track. So that is going to be actually, I think, the sound that I was not really super happy with. Yep. And it's going to be right around that same frequency. Maybe I'll just make this. There we go. Oh, I had that boost. I forgot. That's why I don't leave it on that uh, channel. But I knew that I already had an EQ there. But yeah, I was boosting it there on accident. Sits better.
Let's see what we... I'm gonna unfreeze this, see how it does. It does not do good. Um... But this would be something, I might have come off the, I might have come off the low end a little bit too much, but let's see. Something else I want to say is like the your kick and your bass are always going to be the probably the most challenging thing to um, to get to get things right in the pocket. So the first thing I'll do, obviously, like if I'm if I'm working on a that's I've oh you can see all these different options that I've like duplicated and tried out to see what like sometimes I'll add a hi-hat on the kick and sometimes I'll like just add just the little bit of hi-hat on the kick to give it a little click on it but first thing you do obviously is okay so the kick drum sounds good by itself to me at least um, and then you see like when you're mixing the kick and the bass like just work on getting solo those things and get them to sound good together, right? So here's like, yeah, because if you can't get if you can't get the kick and the bass to sound good on their own together, it's not gonna sound better once you start layering a bunch of other stuff on it. So so do that like take some time to kind of sculpt the relationship with the kick and the bass. Um, Lars had uh, said something about about stuff that is problematic with the key getting tracks in key, and a lot of times the problems that you've got with a bass line and a kick not working together, a lot of times it's the key of the two. And if you can get the key right for so long, I would like have the bass and the kick, and I would EQ the life out of the bass line to try to make room for the kick. And then I'd say, well, the, the bass line disappeared. And it, it's like, because they're not in this, they're, they weren't in the right key together and they weren't, they were like, or they were playing the exact same frequencies. So find out the, the way to, and, and you don't need to know music theory to know this. You just have to pay attention to like the tuning. Everybody knows, like William Hung, would not if people didn't know what out of tune sounded like william hung would have never become famous because he was so famous for being completely out of tune that people like book tickets to go see him sing she bangs you know so like everybody has an ear for what's in tune or what's out of tune you don't really need musical talent for that um at least i don't think and so <clears throat> My voice is very out of tune right now. But so pay attention, just play around with the, the pitch of the, of the bass, like what, what the, the bass notes are. If it's, if it's a sample, um, then you're gonna be more limited than if you use a, like a synthesizer. So if you're using samples, then it's gonna be important to get the sample correct uh, the, the correct sample for that key because once you start pitching something up, it's going to start degrading the quality. So you're better just to get it um, right, right out of the box. But you can pitch it to some variance on a bass, but um, the the kicks really start to to struggle once you start pitching them up or pitching them down. So, okay, sounds like there's some. Um, some nice feedback on the mixed and key plugin. I, I might have to, 
I might have to spend, uh, take the blunt, take the plunge. Any questions? Any other questions? Another thing for mixing is try to find like the busiest part of the tracks. So this would be really busy. So I'm gonna lose this part. separate sub bass to uh, track to add some low end to the sub bass um spas uh, spas uh, i hope i'm saying your name right i know i make that disclaimer a lot here um in this case no because because a lot of the energy a lot of the energy of a track is actually sitting above the the kick let me pull up an example actually i'll just dump the metric ab plugin in okay so i've got this plugin that i really recommend if you've sometimes it goes on sale it can go on sale for about 50 bucks but it's called uh metric ab and you can load up to 16 reference tracks in here. And their tracks, like load up different sounding tracks that you know, that you know what they sound like. So this one, for example, this is a great example of a track that is absolutely massive on every sound system I've ever played it on. Um, there the the frequency range on this like the kick punch in here but a lot of that energy a lot of that energy is coming above that kick drum okay so like that sounds really slow by compare compared to the tempos of today but um yeah I'm going to put an EQ on this. A lot of that energy is coming above that kick drum, but it sounds like the track when you play it on a big sound system sounds massive. So for some, a mistake you can make is you're like, I want to make my track sound like that. But the energy is not in the, the energy, the, the kick's really nice. But a lot of the action is going on right there. Like you can see whenever it like filters it out there. So the, so the kick drum goes away here. And like you don't see a huge, uh, change in this frequency spectrum 
when the kick drum goes out, it just bumps up right there. Yeah. So that kind of answers the uh, that kind of answers the question. Oh yeah. Thank God that it wasn't a side by side comparison, and that I just had the kick drum playing. Because I was like, man, I didn't think my track was that weak. Um, given it's like you're, you've got uh, yeah it's pretty yeah you can do like a side by side comparison so yeah it's pretty close in the neighborhood and uh, next question from Juan Carlos Mendoza uh, let's say I have 189 audio clips in my DAW project, all harmonic and mixture of rhythm. So this can help me avoid those frequencies, uh, crashes, and saturation. It's a bit confusing to me. Saludos desde, uh, desde Mexico. Mexico. Um, Carlos, um, maybe... Let's see, I have 89, 189, all harmonic and mixture. This can help me avoid those. Okay. Okay, I think you're talking about the, the mixed in key plugin. So, yeah. If I'm not understanding your co question correctly, uh, Juan Carlos, then, uh, then just let me know. Any other questions? Anybody? Nothing? So yeah, I think that kind of covers everything on this track. And um, what I... Uh, can you go over the kick and bass uh, compression? Do you have another ghost channel of the kick and sidechain that? What kind of uh, ratio threshold do you use? Um, Prithvi, I, am I, I hope I, yeah. Prithvi, in response to that, I had a, I had like, I tried all kinds of different compression. And if you, if you didn't join right away, I struggled a lot with getting this track to sound decent. Um, I was like trying like putting like drum bus stuff on and it's like it sounded sometimes it would hype it up and it would make me think it sounded good and then it didn't and then I I use this uh, Alicia compressor um, called the impressor which I love and I've got the it's a very very cautious compression setting like the attack it's really not doing a whole lot like um so in this regard i don't i don't have a, i don't compress a lot on this kick drum that i'm using i think there is no compression on it uh there's a little bit of compression right here I've got like a four to one ratio. Fifty six milliseconds. But what you can really do is you can just play with the ratio or play with the attack. For me, the big th the big mistake that people make is setting the attack on a kick too short. Because what starts happening and I'll do a real drastic version of this. So to give you, well, let me just, let me set up a separate compressor on this. What you can do with the compressor, and you can, 
I always say to understand, the best thing you can do to understand compression is to set things really drastically and then work backwards. So turn up the ratio all the way, turn down the attack all the way and turn up the release. And then like bring down, slam down that threshold. Well, first off you can see what like, watch the gain reduction here. You see this yellow, yellow uh, band? That's what a three second release of uh, does, okay? So if people don't understand what it does, do if you do it really drastically, then it makes sense. So you pull it off, one, two, three, and then it starts to like recover, okay? Um, and then, but the common mistake that people make, let's just set it at four or something like this. Common mistake that people make is they, don't ever let that kick, that initial part of the kick punch through. So right there, there's nothing punching through. But if you can get it between like, I don't know, like 30, 30 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds is what I do. But I'm not a, I'm not a compression guru is, is what I would say. And, um, Sometimes, sometimes things don't need compression. Sometimes kick drums don't need compression. Like the, the whole, the, the idea of compressing a kick drum, keep in mind that that came from the old days of drum machines that a lot has changed since like you would always hear and I would always like pay attention to what older producers than me were saying is they would always be like, yeah, you've got to, you've got to compress a 909 kick. Like you put compression, those sounds great with the right amount of compression. And so I would get 909 samples. I'd go get a 909 sample pack and I'd be like, right, my favorite producers talked about 909 kick drums sounding great with compression. But the thing is, is they're talking about the drum machine itself needing compression. Like the drum machine needed to be processed. But these, a lot of the samples that you're getting are already processed. And so you might not need the compression on those samples. A lot of the samples that you might be working with already have compression on them. So that's really where you've got to trust your ear and say, don't believe like, okay, it's a kick drum, so it needs compression. Well, you don't know. It depends on if the sample has already been compressed and ultimately if it sounds like it needs compression and uh rob acid who i think is like studio genius he rob acid uh robert uh babbitts uh, i think is his actual name he said something years ago and it made it really changed my perspective on it. He said, if you, if you don't know what a compressor does, then why do you use it? And it's not to say like, you need like, understand what something's doing. If don't just throw something on there because you thought that it, like, if you don't know what something does, then it's impossible to know if it needs it or not. If that makes sense, you know? And if you don't know what something does, then play around with it. Like play around with all the different settings and say, okay, I know, I don't know anything about compression, but I do know that when I bring the threshold all the way down to zero or negative infinity, it doesn't sound good. Now what happens if I bring it back up a little bit? Okay, now it's starting to sound cool. But now let's give it the ultimate test. I mean, that, you're talking about that type of difference 
is now you're like, okay, now it starts stressing it a little bit. So yeah, just play around with it, you know, go from there. So, um, let's see. Yeah. So, okay. I just read the comments that the kick sounds good. So that's, that's great to hear. Um, and like I said, there is like almost no compression on that. There is almost, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of side chaining on the like bass and I put a little bit of saturation on it to just give it a little bit of texture and kind of give it some harmonics. Um, and then I've got it side chained to the kick drum. Any other questions? Any other questions? Because I think that this is it's about done. Um, one thing that I wanted to refer to, uh, our friend Lars in the chat had asked, what about leaving like six decibels of headroom? And he was asking because the, the track right here, it's hitting, it's right at zero. Obviously, you never want it to turn red. But you want to get it for, for like, if you want to test tracks in clubs, um, then you want it kind of getting close to zero. Ideally, like negative point one or something, uh, give or take, is ideal. Um, but when you're sending something off to mastering, then you want to make sure that uh, that you have you give them like six decibels of headroom. So you actually want to bring down. You want to turn off everything on the master channel, so it's going to be really quiet. The reason for that is is if you give six decibels of headroom, that gives the mastering engineer the ability to do a lot of stuff with the track. It just gives them a, a buffer. So, so like say, say you're at, say you're already at zero here. And so now I send the track that's like this, and then we get the mastering engineer and he puts an EQ and he says, ah, it needs, it needs some, uh, it needs a little bit of bass. Well now, now just with three, with a three uh, decibel boost of, in the bass frequencies, it's clipping. So he, the, like, the mastering engineer, like he or she can't do anything with that track in the low end or because you're already approaching clipping before you send it. So you need to back off the volume. You need to turn off all of the... Um, I mean, you can have like a little bit of EQ, you can have even like a, a little bit of compression, but if you're using a compressor, really back off the compressor, like back, bring the threshold up a lot more so that you're, you're not, if you're sending something off to mastering, trust the mastering engineer is gonna know what to do on the master bus, the master channel more than you do, okay? So that, that was a good question from Lars early. Um, in the beginning, you were talking about, this is from Piotr. Um, in, the, in the beginning, you were talking about EQing out low frequencies on the bass to reduce clashing with the kick, yeah? Is it necessary to make room like that if you're also side-chaining to the kick? Um, I mean, those are, those are two different things. 
Uh, for me, I think that the the bass is always like so. Let's say, for example. Let's just turn this, so I'm using like side chaining, right? So this is the frequency spectrum here after it's been side chained and after it's, I EQ and then I side chain. And that's what the frequency spectrum is. But if I don't EQ it, It's not, it, it's, it, it's not fixing the problem. The side chaining is not fixing the problem if I've got bass frequencies that are really cramping the kick style, you know? So then I'm gonna put that back on. And now we're back in business. Any other questions? Man, I think I yell in these, because I've got the headphones on and I'm like, I'm that person that's talking really loud with headphones on. Sorry about that. Questions, questions. Okay, something I would love for you all to do is if you've got a track that you're working on, and I'm just gonna give you this YouTube link um, because there is, if you've got a, I want to keep track of everything in the same place. And there's some examples of the tracks that are examples from what people have done. I'm going to do a session at some point uh, discussing other people's tracks, loading up their sessions. And so let me find it. Okay. Found the link. And at eight. Okay. Ignore the, the, I'm given like an update in this about when workshops are. This is an older video, but post tracks of yours in the comments of this. And then uh, tell me a specific problem you're having with that track. And I might ask you to, if I listen to it and I feel like this could be something good that we could all learn from. I might ask to, for you to upload uh, the Ableton session, or if you're not working in Ableton um, and you're not using just the factory plugins, um, then I'll have you upload the stems and then I can kind of load those in to a session and go from there to talk about the question you have. So. Uh, Lars, what about using parallel compression on a return bus to send it to the kick bass channel? Sometimes I do do that. Um, I won't cover that today, but uh, sometimes if, if a track's just lacking that kind of, that body in the low end, the, the kick and the bass, I'll try parallel compression. I mean, parallel compression's one of those things that, again, you can really overdo it, but uh, if you use it right, you can really make the tracks fatten up quite nicely. Um, and that's parallel compressions, like a uh, entire workshop topic, I think. And could someone, I think there's a good, uh, tutorial on dub spot for parallel compression. Could someone see if, uh, dub spot has parallel compression video and post it maybe in the comments here. Yeah, Piotr, could you do that? Uh, post it in that YouTube comment so that I have like all the, I, I remember that you posted something this morning, but post it in the comments of this YouTube channel as well because I wanna keep track of everything all in one place. That would be really nice if you could do that and just post the same question that you had. So, any other questions? 
Daniel, you said uh, yes, please, but I don't know what you were saying yes, please, too. Um, there's no other questions. Um, then I will go and I will keep you posted on uh, the next the next uh, week's schedule. Um, I want to tell you tomorrow will be a, I when I'm on Twitch. Um, the way I describe it is like Twitch is kind of more of like a hangout, and that's kind of just we talk about not just music. We talk about life. I talked about uh, I think let's see air conditioning, junk food, um, all kinds of stuff. And it's just a fun little place to hang out. And we've been kind of building a community there. So feel free to join in. Uh, I'm going to be doing a Twitch stream tomorrow night. I believe I said at 10 o'clock, uh, tomorrow night, Berlin time. And yeah, that's going to be that's going to be a thing where we just are hanging out and I, I'm always working on music. Sometimes I'm more distracted than others. We'll probably have a few drinks, uh, in the, during the Twitch, uh, session. Um, and, uh, yeah, so be, be a good time and it's always a good laugh there. So I hope you join tomorrow night at 10 PM Berlin time. Um, Ben Perry, what's up, Ben on that, on track that you think are being close to them. Do you do a pseudo master yourself or do you send it to Connor? I do. I do a pseudo master myself. Cause I always want to like test it out in clubs and whatnot, uh, to see, I, cause you want it to get kind of, kind of a feel to, to see what's, what the next steps are. And yeah, so I do a pseudo master. I test it out if I have the luxury of nightclubs, which is a not a common occurrence right now, but yeah, you can test it out in nightclubs and that's a huge advantage. But yeah, pseudo master, if you're going to listen to it in like a car or something like that, that can also be good. If you're going to compare it to other tracks, that can be good. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I've never released a track that I've done my own mastering on. So, yeah. All right. You're welcome, Sebastian. Good to have you. Hope everybody has a wonderful Thursday night. And we will see you tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Twitch ta- twitch.tv slash Kyle Geiger. Bring friends. Bring drinks bring Doritos. I miss those things over here. Um, But yeah, see you. Thanks a lot.